Okay, this section is to 10.2, uh, which is polar equations and graphs. However, this section is really lengthy as far as the amount of paper that's in the notes. Um, so I'm gonna try to go through it, but there might be some points where I might need to go a little bit faster, especially when it comes to like problems where I'm filling in a table. Um, I don't need to show you every single calculator stroke in order for me to evaluate. I'll probably show you the first one. Um, but eventually on say like these problems. So I already have written out some of the stuff just to kind of shorten the video a little bit. And then when it comes down to here, I'll show you how I calculate about two of them and then the rest of it, I'm just gonna fill out, okay? Um, just to kind of not waste too much of the video time. So in this section, we're gonna be talking about two things. One is the polar equations. We already know how to convert back and forth. So sometimes that might help us to graph. Um, and then sometimes there's some um, functions that are just easier to graph in polar coordinates. And so in those cases, we will just stick to the polar coordinate system to graph them, okay? Um, and of course, there will be rules and, and, and patterns for you to notice as we get to that point in the lecture. Um, it says for the first thing it wants us to do is look at the polar grid. It's different, right? We mentioned that in 10.1, that it's not the same as the rectangular system, which has boxes. This one has circles instead, okay? So your units are still one, two, three, four, five, but instead of lines making the one, two, three, four, five, now you have circles making the one, two, three, four, five, okay? So when we plot this point, we're going to go out five in the radius and then go up pi over four units, right? So that's this um, point there. Then if I plot this point, I'm going to go negative two units and then five pi over six, but because it's positive, I have to go clockwise. So, I'm sorry, counterclockwise. Yes, counterclockwise. That's the way you go for um, positives. So I'm going to go pi over six and then another pi, I'm going to go pi and then another pi over six. And I end up at this spot here. Okay. And this is theta equal to five pi over six. Now it wants us to look at this here. So it says for these points, we converted them in the last section. We converted this one to this. And if you type this in the calculator, you get 3.5, same number. So it's also 3.5. And then we converted this to this in the last section. And square root of three is roughly 1.7 and negative one is negative one. So we also converted this point. Now, when I converted this point into uh, these coordinates, polar coordinates, if I were to type this in a calculator, I get 4.2. And then it helps me to use degrees rather than radians when I'm graphing. Um, the book and the computer will go back and forth between the two. Um, but I typically, when I'm graphing, I like to use degrees just because my brain works a little bit better this way than it does with the fractions. Um, I mean, not to say that I don't know fractions, it's just this is easier. <laughs> And if I have the choice, I'm going to go with what is easier, right? So I like to convert my radians into uh, degrees just so that I can see where it is. Now, when I'm computing things, I like to leave it in radians. So when I'm doing my algebra or my trig, I like to leave it in radians. But when I'm trying to graph, I like to have it in degrees. Um, not always. Some of the problems, I will be forced to leave it in um, radians, and that's okay. Um, but if I ever have a choice, that's what I choose. So if I were to graph this point in radians, notice that I would have to go out one, two, three, four. Is that right? One, two, three, four. And then a little bit more, right? A little bit more would be like right here, 4.2, about right there. But then I have to go around 135 degrees. So if I go around, this is 90 and then this is 100, another 45 degrees, which means it's 135 degrees. And I put 135 degrees there. But if I look at its rectangular coordinates, 
that's negative three for X and positive three for Y. You'll notice that it lands in the exact same spot. So you're just verifying that the rectangular coordinates that you found are the same as the polar and vice versa. They will get you to the correct spot, okay? So when you're graphing, it doesn't matter whether you're graphing in rectangular coordinates or whether you're graphing in um, polar coordinates, okay? And then they always, always got to be formal, right? So the formal definition, an equation whose variables are polar coordinates is called a polar equation. So if you see r's and thetas in the equation, that's a polar equation. And if you see um, x's and y's, then that's a rectangular equation. And it says the graph of a polar consists of all points whose polar coordinates satisfy the equation, okay? So here it says, identify the graph and graph the equation r equals three, okay? And so it says one, to do this, we're gonna use the techniques from the last section to convert the polar equation to a rectangular equation. So we talked about in the last section, when it's just r equal to a number, the strategy is to square both sides. So if I square the left side and I square the right side, I get r squared equals nine. And then we can switch to rectangular coordinates. So r squared is the same as x squared plus y squared equal to nine. And this is the graph of a circle. And I like to add some more detail with radius equal to the square root of nine, which is three and center at zero, zero because there's nothing inside the square, right? Um, and so then if I want to graph that, I'm going to have the radius three, and then it's just a circle around the center zero, zero. So here's your center, and then there's your circle. Even with the guided lines on there, my circle still doesn't come out straight. That's so frustrating. Okay, but <laughs> assume that's a nice pretty circle. Um, now, for example, two, it wants us to do the same thing, but this one's different, right? For this one, we have to apply the strategy where um, if you have a trig function in the problem, then what you need to do, actually, I don't have r equal to a trig function. I just have r sine theta equal to a number. I don't even need to multiply by r on both sides or square both sides because this right here automatically converts into y. So the equation will become y equals to two. And so that's the graph of a horizontal line. So then if I graph that, that's a horizontal line at the y value of two. So it just looks like a line going this way. And that's, that happens to also, another representation is r sine theta equal to two. So then now for example three, very similar. I already have r cosine theta. We know that that is x. So this one is a vertical line. And when the x value equals negative two, that means that the vertical line is going this way. And then example four, says for us to identify the equation of this one. Now we know that theta is 10 inverse of y over x from the last section, right? In the last section, they used this relationship, which means that theta by itself is 10 inverse of y over x, okay? So I substituted that and now I have it in rectangular coordinates. And then I would have y over x equal to the tangent of pi over three. Let me come over here, which means y over x equals square root of three. And if I multiply both sides by x, I get square root of three times x. Or another version of saying it would be y is about 1.7x, okay? So what does that mean? That means this is the graph of a line with slope of 1.7 
and y intercept zero because there's no constant being added, okay? So then if my y intercept is zero, I have a point here and then I have to go up 1.7 and then over one unit. So it's about right here, okay? And then if I draw that line, we've got it there, okay? And so it's basically a ray or a line at whatever angle that was. So that was pi over three. Um, I actually graphed it wrong, but it should be a line at pi over three. So zero and then 1.7 and one. Oh, there we go. That's where it's supposed to be. The, I'm supposed to go up 1.7 and then over one. Why is it not lining up for me? Oh, here's the unit one, because I'm not reading it right. So 1.7 and one is right here. And that is the angle pi over three. And so when you draw the line, you just basically get this line here. My eyes are always playing tricks on me but you get the idea, you get that line. Oh, you can't even see it, okay? So the up 1.7 and over one, because you can always write this as a fraction um, and you can always just write it 1.7 over one. Now that's not formal, it's not an actual fraction because fractions are not allowed to have decimals in them, but it helps me for the purpose of being able to graph the slope. It's positive, so I go up 1.7 units and then over. If it were negative 1.7, I would be at the origin. I would go down 1.7 units and then still over to the right. Now for the next one, example five, it wants us to graph both of these. We'll do them separately. So this one is R equal to a trig function. So I will multiply both sides by R and I will get this. And then this side becomes x squared plus y squared equals 3y. If I move the y, the 3y over to get it equal to 0, and I complete my square, um, negative 3 over 2 squared is actually 9 over 4. So this will be plus nine over four and then zero plus nine over four is just nine over four. And so I get y minus what's in here, three halves equal to nine over four. So again, this one is a circle with the radius. So these are the graph of circles. And then for the first one, it's radius is three over two and the center is zero and positive three halves. Always take the positive version of those, okay? So then um, for the next one, we're gonna do the same thing. So multiply both sides by R and then convert. So X squared plus Y squared equals two X subtract over the x and then complete that square. So negative two over two squared, which is the same as negative one squared, which is one. So I'm gonna add one to both sides. Zero plus one is one. And then inside the parentheses, I had minus one. And so then for this one, I get radius equal to one and center is the opposite sign and then of course zero. So I'll draw both of those on here. So first we're gonna start with zero and three halves, which is right here. So this is the center. And then from there, I'm gonna go three, three and a half units out this way, three and a half units this way, and then three and a half units. So one and a half is about right there and then one, one and a half 
is about right here. So then if I try my best to make a circle, you see this one, okay? So again, that's the best circle I can draw. It looks kind of like an oval, but that's this graph, okay? This other graph, the center is one and zero. Let me do that one in a different color. Um, where is my red? There it is. So for this one, we're gonna do it in red. So we got one zero is our center, and then we go out one, one, go up one, and then go down one. And so this one's a little bit of a smaller radius, but it's a circle over here on the side. So that's this equation, okay? So the pencil one is the first equation, and then the red one is the second equation, cosine. So let's see. So that's how we graph if we're going to take the polar equation and then just convert it into a rectangular equation because then we can graph like circles and lines and things like that and it's not a problem but not every polar equation can be converted into a rectangular equation it's just sometimes not possible okay um and sometimes you just make things more complicated when you try to do so so we do need to actually talk about how to graph polar equations as polar equations, okay? And especially if they're not of the types that we just discussed that can be converted nice and easily to um, rectangular coordinates. But before we try to graph them, because essentially what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to figure out what's going along around the whole circle, okay? And sometimes multiple times around the circle. It depends, okay, on the problem. And that's gonna get annoying having to fill out a table for all of those values. Now, if you notice, they usually like to break up the, the polar coordinate system. All these gray lines you see is in twelfths. And why is it in twelfths um, with the 12 in the denominator? Because between the denominator six for pi over six, the denominator three, pi over three, and the denominator four for pi over four, the common denominator between all three of those denominators is 12. So what they do is they say, well, this is one twelfths, this is two twelfths, which is actually pi over six. This is three twelfths, which is pi over four, four twelfths, which is pi over three, 5 twelfths, so they don't really write here, and then 6 twelfths, which is pi over 2. And so that's why they're using that particular um, system to do the values is so that um, you have everything there, okay? But it's going to, that's a lot. It 12, how many twelfths do you have in 2 pi? 24. 24 twelfths makes 2 pi. You do not want to have a table with 24 values. You just don't, okay? So what we're gonna talk about here is using symmetry to kind of figure out what our tables should be, okay? So you do wanna test for symmetry. Now symmetry, um, there's different kinds, okay? So you've got symmetry with respect to the y-axis, which is the same as saying symmetry with respect to the line theta equal to pi over two. You have symmetry with respect to the origin, which is the same as saying symmetry with respect to the pole. It's a little center there. It's got two names now, origin and rectangular coordinates, pole and polar coordinates. But I always call it origin no matter what, but that's just me. Um, and then you have the x-axis or the polar axes. This is basically where your terminal side of your ray is at all the time. Um, and so those are the three different symmetries. So remember that symmetry with respect to the y-axis means that it reflects over the y-axis. So if you had a point here, you just change the x value to a negative and now you have the point over there. Um, if you reflect downward like this, that means the y-coordinate or the theta-coordinate is changing to a negative, okay? And then if you have a point over here and it's with, uh, symmetry with respect to the pole, 
essentially it reflects over pi, right? So it reflects all the way over here. But what I generally do when I'm trying to draw them, and this is important, okay? What I generally do is I draw a dotted graph. So I always say like, okay, if I were to reflect over say the X axis, that would be over here. Right, that would be right there. If I were to reflect over the X axis, it would look like this. But then if I were to reflect over the Y axis, it would land exactly where it's showing it is. Okay. And so that's why it's important that I do this because this is going to help me to draw my figure, my pictures and you'll see that in a little bit. Okay. So in order to get, in order for me to draw something that has symmetry with respect to the origin, I would have to flip it over here and then flip it over there. Okay. And the same thing goes, if anything was on this quadrant, I would have to flip it down and then flip it over. Okay. And the middle step isn't really there. It's where it lands in the very end after both flipping, that is your actual graph. Okay. So, um, this is going to be important because you do not want to sit here and make a table of 24 values, one pi over 12, two pi over 12, three pi over 12, all the way up to two pi. If you have symmetry with respect to the Y axis, meaning it's going to look the same over here than it does over there, then you, in your graph, you only need to worry about negative pi over two to pi over two in your table because then that's gonna cover this whole side, right? The negative pi over two side to the positive pi over two side. It's gonna cover all of the right-hand side. And if it has symmetry with respect to the y-axis, then you basically just mirror it and you have the other half of the graph. It cuts you having to do 24 values down to only having to do 12, okay? Now, here for the origin, um, you only need to graph from zero to pi over two. And why do I only need to graph from zero to pi over two? Because what's gonna happen is whatever you have over here, well, I don't know where it's gonna be. It could be over here, just because I picked these numbers doesn't mean that that's where the points are gonna land, right? Because you have to plug them into a function and then that's where they land. Normally when you have symmetry with respect to the origin, your graph is already gonna be wherever it's gonna be. And then you just have to shadow it over, shadow it over and you'll have the graph and take every portion of it and shadow it over like that. And you'll be able to get the entire graph, okay? Now for the X axis, you're going to wanna use zero to pi. Again, if you do zero to pi, then you should end up having the entire image. And then you just need to reflect it over the X axis. I keep pointing to this one, but that's actually this one you graph it, whatever it is, and then you reflect it over the x-axis and you'll get the whole graph, okay? So I'm mentioning these intervals because these are gonna be very important when I try to graph some really weird things in polar coordinates, okay? So I have to be able to look at a function and then be able to tell whether or not it has symmetry with respect to the x-axis, the y-axis, or the origin, okay? Um, and it's not easy to just look at them and be able to know. So what we do is we do tests. And the test for symmetry for the x-axis means you replace the theta with negative theta. And if you get the exact same equation, then it's symmetric with respect to the x-axis. If you have symmetry with respect to the y-axis, it means when you replace theta with pi minus theta, again, you get the same exact equation. If I have symmetry with respect to the origin, I can replace R with negative R, or I can replace theta with theta plus pi. Now, typically I like to use this one um, because that's the one that usually helps me to figure it out. Sometimes I do that one, but if this one doesn't tell me anything, then I just go to that one, okay? But normally I stick with this one. So really you're just replacing theta with different things. You're replacing theta with negative theta for x axis, theta with pi minus theta for the y axis, and then theta plus pi for the origin. Okay.
So here we have, it says, these three tests for symmetry are sufficient conditions for symmetry, but they are not necessary conditions. Describe what this means. So I've broken it down for you. And it says a test may be failed, but the graph may still have that particular type of symmetry. Okay. So don't think that you've graphed it wrong if you did a test and you say, oh, it doesn't have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. But then when you graph it, you realize, oh, it does have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. That's okay. It can happen. Okay. That's what we're wanting you to know. I don't want you to erase everything you've done saying this doesn't match because it's not necessary that it will match. Okay. However, if the test is passed, then you are guaranteed that your graph will have that per that specific symmetry. Okay. So if I did the test and I found out that it has symmetry with respect to the x axis, then my graph better reflect symmetry with respect to the x axis. Got it? Um, so it's just, you can't, you can't be surprised if you do all the tests and then it doesn't match exactly. Um, but it does have to match whatever you said worked. Okay. So, and I don't know that that's going to happen to me in my examples. I can't even remember. It's been a while since I did them, but um, we're going to test for our symmetry and then see. Okay. So this first example has to do with cardioids. Okay. And cardioids kind of look like hearts. They, they don't have like a sharp thing like this, like a normal heart, like you see for Valentine's day. They're more like a little dip. So it's kind of like a little curve like that. And then they don't have a point here. It's just kind of a curve. So more kind of looks like this. And it actually even looks more round than that. Um, it's more like that. Okay. Now they can look like this or they can be upside down where the, the kind of a little bean now, doesn't it? Um, but they could be upside down, they could be over here, okay, or they could be over here. I can't draw for nothing today, but it's okay. Um, but they could be facing in all the different directions, okay? They don't necessarily have to be facing up like a traditional heart that we think of when we think cardioid, we're thinking cardiac <laughs> heart, right? But it is kind of that shape. So, um, these are all the different equations that you could have and each one of them results in one of those four um, images so whether it's straight upward it's upside down the little bend is to the right or the little bend is to the left it all depends on which one of these you graph okay so they are giving us this function here and if you notice if i factor out that two this is going to be of the equation form it's going to be of the equation this one, okay? So that's the one that I wrote there. Now, that means it's a cardioid if it fits that particular um, form. Um, now, for the test for symmetry, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test for the x-axis. Now, that's the same as the polar axis, but I like to use the words x-axis, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to plug in negative theta. And now remember that that is the same as cosine of theta by your even and odd properties, right? Our even and odd properties told us, on oh my eraser shavings, um, told us that cosine of negative theta is the same as cosine of theta. So notice that this results in the exact same uh, equation as the original, okay? Which means I do have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. Now I'm gonna move on to the y-axis. So I have r equal to, and for this one, I'm going to replace cosine, or I'm gonna replace theta with pi minus theta. And so then I'm gonna use my sum and difference formulas to calculate this out. So I get cosine pi, cosine theta, plus sine pi, sine theta. Now remember that sine of pi is zero. So when I 
do zero times anything, the whole thing is just going to be zero. And when I add zero, I just end up with the same term. Also understand that the cosine of pi is negative one. So when I multiply, I get two negative two cosine theta. And this is not equivalent to the original. It just isn't. The original had a plus sign. This has a minus sign. So I do not have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Now I'm going to try the origin. So this time I'm going to replace theta with theta plus pi. And when I do that, I'm going to do my sum formula again. So cosine, and I really should have had this two like this, because it's two times whatever this is. So really, it should have been like this, OK? But that still comes out, because 2 times 0 is just 0. So here, I'm going to correct it and do cosine theta, cosine pi, minus sine theta, sine pi. Same issue as before. Sine of pi is 0. And 0 times anything is just a big fat 0. So what I end up with is 2 plus 2 cosine of 0. That's supposed to be a theta. Cosine of pi is a negative 1. And then that's just a big 0. So actually, I shouldn't even put a 2. Because positive 2 times this factor, or this term, is going to be negative 2 cosine theta. And then 2 times 0 is just 0. So really, I'm just end up with this. Now again, that does not equal the original. It's got the wrong sign in the middle. So I do not have symmetry with respect to the origin, okay? And so now what they want me to do is because I have symmetry with respect to the x-axis, they want me to do my coordinates only from zero to pi. Remember I talked about that on the other page. We talked about when we have a symmetry with respect to the x-axis, we only need to go from zero to pi, okay? So I've got this here. And just FYI, if you don't have any symmetry, then unfortunately you do have to go from zero to pi to two pi, okay? If you don't have any symmetry. I don't know what is going on with my blinds, but they are, that light is shining through. Let me see if this will help. I don't think that helps. Maybe it does a little bit, okay. So when I'm trying to put this in the calculator, because I have to type in all these values. Now notice they did save me. They didn't do um, the 12s, right? Pi over 12. Why didn't they do pi over 12s? Because regular pi over 12s are not in the calc, are not um, in our regular unit circle. So of all those pi 12s, they only put the ones that were actually on the unit circle. So pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, pi over two, two pi over three, all of them in order, just like they are on your unit circle, okay? Um, so definitely wanna have your unit circle. Now the unit circle will already be on the review and it will already be on the test. Um, but when you're doing your homework, you definitely wanna have it with you, okay? Because when I say do the, all the values between zero and pi, you want to know what all those values are from your unit circle. Okay, so what do I do? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say zero store as x in my calculator. And then I'm going to type in this equation right here. 2 plus 2 cosine 2 plus 2 cosine x. Okay, now I'm in radian mode. If you are not in radian mode, Make sure you are because these are all radians, okay? So when I hit enter, it's going to automatically plug in zero and I get four, okay? When I do pi over six stores x and I plug it in, I get the same thing they do. They switch the order of the terms on me, but it doesn't matter. If you want the decimal and you do need the decimals in order to be able to graph them, just hit the double arrow here and it'll give you the decimal, which is 3.73, okay? So then the point here becomes four for R and zero for theta. Here it becomes 3.73 for R and then pi over six for theta. Now be careful, because this is a little bit backwards than when you do X and Y. 
right? When you did X, you always plug that in first and then you found the Y. And so they were in order exactly the same way they were here. Left, right, left, right. In polar coordinates is different because your functions are in terms of theta. So you do have to use thetas first to find the Rs, but your form is supposed to be R and then theta, okay? So just be very careful when, you, when you're um, putting them in their point forms that you don't put them in the wrong order. Um, okay, so instead of doing this for all of them, I'm just gonna kind of, cause it's gonna take time to type every single one of those in there. So this one, I'm gonna get 3.4 at the end. I'm gonna get three, two, one, 0 0.6, 0 0.3 and zero. And so then the points are 3.4 and pi over four, three and pi over three, two pi over two, one, two pi over three, um, 0 0.6 and three pi over four, 0 0.3, five pi over six, and then um, zero in pi. Okay. So those are all of my coordinates. Now what they want us to do is they want us to graph this all together, okay? So I'm gonna leave this page here because I need it for my coordinates. And I'm gonna zoom in because it's a really tiny graph and I want you to be able to see where I'm plotting these points, okay? So let's see here. Um, first one is four and zero. Let's see if I can get this in the image. There we go. So four and zero is my first one. So four units out, no angle. So my point is going to be right there. Okay. Then 3.73, which is about right here and pi over six. So that's about right here. Then 3.4, which is a little bit less than half of it, and pi over four, so it's about right there. And then three and pi over three, and then two and pi over two, and then one and two pi over three, and then 6.6, .6, so it's a little bit more than half. It's a little bit more than half. And oh, 3 pi over 4, which is this guy. I'm trying to get in there. You could probably see it a little bit better than I can, although that point looks a little shiny. Let's see if I turn off the light. Oh, yeah, that's much better. Okay. And then I'm going to do 0.3 and 5 pi over 6. And then I'm going to do 0 and pi. So no radius and really wouldn't matter what the angle is. It's just going to land right on top of the pole or the origin. And so if I trace this from the starting point to where I stopped, and it is important you do go in that order, I get this image here. Okay. So now what I've got to do is I've got to mirror that over the X axis because the X axis has the same, it has symmetry with respect to the X axis. So what I'm going to end up doing is graphing this and you could be more specific if you wanted to. I don't, I just sketch it because in the computer, you're just going to select um, from choices. And the same thing on the review and the test. Although I could be very specific and make sure that it's there and reflected, there and reflected, there and reflected. This one, oops, see, that one's supposed to be reflected, which means I'm supposed to go all the way out there. Um, and then make sure that that one is reflected and this one and this one, right? So on and so forth. So you get the idea though, of what kind of shape it's gonna have. It does, it looks like, a cardioid um, and it does look like it has a, a sharp tip in there like the little dent but um, it may not necessarily look like that on the on the computer 
Just make sure you're clicking the one that has the dent going inward and then the dent starts at zero and then the, the I call it the butt of the heart. This one doesn't make any sense, but I guess the bottom of the heart um, has to be at that point four. Okay, so just make sure the little dent point and the bottom point are where they should be and that it has the dent toward the correct way. Like, is it on this left? Is it up top? Is it at the bottom? Is it on the right? Where's the little dent at, okay? And make sure you're picking the correct graph that matches yours. Okay, so let's go back out. Now we're gonna move on to what we call, and I cannot say this word. Uh, Limacion usually has like a weird little symbol over here. I can't even, um, I think it's Limacion. I, I, I've also heard Limacon. <laughs> I know that's not the way you're supposed to say it, but, or lima, Limacon, I don't know. This word, <laughs> I'm a visual person. So when I see this word, I'm already imagining what it looks like. Um, and this one's more of like a sharp um, dent, okay? So I know that my graph looked like that was a sharp dent, but most than likely it's probably not. It's probably doing like this on where the zero is. It's probably doing that and then going out. It's just so small that we can't tell. Okay, um, but with these, you do have a sharp um, or a sharper little dent, okay? And this one says without inner loop. So that means they look more like this, okay? And the little dent, the ones that have the inner loop actually do this, okay? So they have like a little loop on the inside. So right now we're talking about the ones without the inner loop. Okay, and how do you know the difference between the ones that are that have the inner loop and the ones that don't have the inner loop? Now notice they're just like the other one. They have sine and cosine. They could have plus or minus in the middle, just like the other one. The difference is, is that in the cardioids, these numbers were the same and then they factored it out, right? Here, the numbers are not the same. So they're letting you know that whatever your constant is, it's gonna be different than the number that's being added or being multiplied by your trig function. Those numbers are different, okay? And it's the same for the, in, the ones with the loop. So the ones without the loop and the ones with the loop will have different numbers as your constant and your multiplier for your trig function. Whereas the cardioids have the same numbers there. Okay, so if I have four and four, it's a cardioid. If I have four and five or five and four, those are one of the limitations. Okay, now how do we know the difference between which one has the inner loop and which one doesn't? When the A value is bigger than the B. So when the constant is bigger, when this guy is bigger, it will look like this. When the coefficient of the trig function is bigger, it will have an inner loop, okay? And that's the big difference there, okay? So when your constant is bigger, it doesn't have an inner loop. When your coefficient is bigger, it does have a bigger, it does have an inner loop. Now, if you look at mine, my constant is bigger than my coefficient for my trig function. So this one is of course not going to have an inner loop. And then it tells me that it's not going to, but at least you know why, okay? But I do have to check for the symmetry anyway. So when I go to test for the symmetry, first I'm gonna do X axes. And how do we do that one? That's the one where we plug in um, negative theta. And again, because of the symmetry of cosine, this is the same as cosine of just regular theta, the odd and even properties. And so then this does match the original. So I do have symmetry with respect to the X axis. Now, when I test for the Y axis, I'm gonna say R equals four minus two cosine of pi minus theta. And I'm gonna use my difference formula there. Cosine pi cosine theta plus sine pi sine theta sine of pi is zero, which makes this whole term go away. Cosine of pi is a negative one. 
So you end up with four and negative two times negative one cosine will be a positive two cosine. And notice that this is not the same as the original, right? So because they're not the same, then this one does not have symmetry with respect to the y axis. So now we try the origin. And for that one, we have to replace the theta with theta plus pi. And so then we're going to use our sum and difference formulas again. So cosine theta, cosine pi minus sine theta, sine pi. Again, sine pi is zero, so all of that's going to go away. Cosine of pi is negative one. So you have negative cosine of theta, which means four plus two cosine of theta, and that is not equivalent to the original, okay? So I don't have symmetry with respect to the origin. So it's the x-axis again. They're not all gonna be that way. It's just coincidence that this one's also the same thing, okay? So then I would fill in my chart. Now, I already showed you how to do that. You would save your first, store your first value as x, and then plug in this expression with an x instead of a theta. Be sure your calculator is in radian mode, and then you go for it, right? You start plugging them all in. So this one gives me two, two point, I used 2.3, they said 2.27, 2.6, 3, 4, 5, 5.1, 5.7, and six. So when I write my points, they're gonna be like this. I'm gonna use 2.3. So bear with me while I write all of these down, just to complete the chart so that you have it when you go back and look at this, or if you downloaded it, to follow along, it'll all be there. Okay, so I filled in everything all the way up to pi. Why did I do zero to pi? Because it had symmetry with respect to the x-axis, right? So then now I'm gonna try to graph this. So let's see how well we can do that. The graphing part's always the hardest part, okay. So two units and then no angle around, so zero. And then 2.3 and up pi over six. And then I'm gonna draw these because this helps me. There's a lot of lines going on here and my eyes are very bad. So Just notice that the one right next to this is pi over six and the other one right next to the red line is pi over three. So that's how I, I have to, it helps me if it stands out, but normally that's what I'm visualizing in my brain, okay? And that's how I'm knowing where to put the points. So I already saw that that one was in the middle. So to get to pi over six, I went to the one right before that line that stands out now in red, okay? Then 2.6 is a little bit more than half, and then pi over 4, which means it's about right there. And then pi over 3 and 3, so that's there. And then 4 and pi over 2. And then 5 and 2 pi over 3, so that's going to be here and then 5.1, so it's real close, but on the other side, oh no, three pi over four, so it's right here. And then this is pi, five pi over six, this line right here, and I gotta go 5.7. So if that were six, five pi over seven would be about right there. And then pi and six, so about here. Okay, and so then if I draw this, okay, notice that it's going to have symmetry on the other side as well. So I'm going to have um, 
these points over here as well. I'm trying to draw it as symmetrical as possible, but I don't know how symmetrical it needs to be. On a computer, you would just get, pick the one that looks like your half and then matches it. Now it kind of looks like it doesn't have a little dip, but it does, it's over here on this side, okay? Um, and you can tell when the points start to converge over there. So see how these points look like they're wider apart from each other, but they seem like they're closer together over here. That's the side where the little dent is happening, okay? Now, again, it's hard to tell there. You, maybe in the computer, the graphs might be a little bit better, but you would pick the graph that has the dent on the right, make sure that the little, the center of the dent is at the coordinate two, and make sure that the butt or the bottom of the dent of the image is at six, okay? And then you should be okay. Now the ones with the inner loop have the same exact equations. All of them are the same. The only thing different here is that the coefficient is now bigger than the constant, okay? So notice in this example, the coefficient of sine is bigger than the constant over here. But I still have to do everything the same. I have to do my symmetry. So when I test for symmetry, I have to plug in um, negative theta for which one? That's for the x-axis. Okay, and then the even and odd properties tell me that the sine of negative theta is actually negative sine of theta, which is negative two sine of theta. Now this is not the same as the original, so I do not have symmetry with respect to the x-axis, like the other ones I did, okay? Then we check the y-axis. So r equals one plus two sine of pi minus theta. I'm gonna use my difference. So two sine pi cosine theta. And then minus sine theta cosine pi. Now remember sine of pi is zero, so this whole term is gonna go away. And then um, cosine of pi is negative one. So in the parentheses, I actually have a positive sine theta. And so then when I multiply that, I do get what equivalent to the original, okay? So this one does have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Then now if I, um, do the origin, hopefully have enough room here. One plus two sine of theta plus pi. Use my sum formula there. Sine theta cosine pi plus um, sine pi cosine theta. Again, sine of pi means this is all gonna go to zero. And cosine of pi we know is negative one. So if I multiply what's in the parentheses, I get negative sine theta. And then if I multiply my constant by that parentheses, I get negative two sine theta. And that is not equivalent to the original. So it does not have symmetry with respect to the origin. Now remember back here a couple of sheets ago, we talked about that when it has symmetry with respect to the y-axis, when it has symmetry with respect to the y-axis, you use negative pi over two over pi over two, okay? So that's the table that they're gonna do here. Now I already talked about how you come up with these values. Store the first one as x, plug this function into your calculator using an x instead of a theta, and then hit enter. And then to get the next one, store this one, go back up to that expression, hit enter twice, and it'll give you the value. If you need to hit the double arrow for a decimal, hit the double arrow for a decimal. But you can go back in the video to the first one to see how I did that, okay? 
Now for me, I'm actually just going to fill this out so that we can actually graph it. Um, here we got 0.7, here we got zero, one, two, 2.7 and then three. So I use negative one and negative pi over two, 0.7. I don't use the seven three, but that's okay. I mean, I can't get that precise. My graph paper is so tiny. Maybe on the computer it's getting that precise, but for me, I cannot. I can barely even get 0.7 accurate much less 0.73, right? So here's the rest of the table. Now we're going to actually graph that, okay? So we're gonna try to plot all these points. So first one, negative one, and then negative pi over two, which means I go clockwise pi over two. So that means the point's actually up here. Then 0.7, positive 0.7. So positive 0.7 is here. And then negative pi over three. This doesn't seem right. This, I think this is supposed to be negative. Let me make sure. I think they have an error there in the paper. Yeah, see, I knew it. It's supposed to be negative. 0.73 or negative 0.7. Ha ha, trying to trick me with their errors. Okay, so let's see. We're going to have negative 0.7 and then pi over 3 going clockwise. So that means I'm going to be here, about there. Again, it's real hard to see this. Let me try to zoom in as much as I can. But again, I'm using these as my standout lines. I know they label them. They label them so that those can stand out to you, but I have to actually like have them in another color so that they really stand out. And so you actually notice my points in the wrong spot then, isn't it? I can't see that far in. I'm gonna have to look at the computer. So I need to go about 0.7, but then to this angle right there. Okay. Now the next point is zero and pi over six. So zero, and it really wouldn't matter what the angle was because it's still just gonna be at the pole or the origin. And then one and zero means I'm at one, but no angle to rotate. And then 2.73 or 2.7. So 2.7 is about here. And then pi over three counterclockwise. So that means I'm gonna go here. And then three and pi over two. So if I follow them in order, it went like this. Now it's not a straight line, it does curve under here. This thing is supposed to be symmetric with respect to the y axis, which means anything that's over here on this side of the y axis, I have to image it over. So that means that there's a point there and there's a point here and I have to mirror it over. So this one will also have a little dip and will also be going around. And I'm trying to make it look, I know my little dip didn't go as low as the other one, but it needs to look symmetric. Not only that, anything that's on this side of the Y axis needs to be mirrored over to the other side. And so that means that these, and now you see that it does have an inner loop, right? It has a little heart shape, but it does have an inner loop on the inside, okay? And again, you're going to be selecting from um, 
choices inside my math labs and choices on the review and choices on the test. So just pick the one that best looks like what you've got, right? Because you may have not graphed it perfectly, but that's okay. It's understandable. Now, example nine, we talk about different things, okay? So those are all of the little heart-shaped things, you know, the ones that got the pointy um, dents, the ones that got the more like curvy dents, the ones that have little loops inside the dents, um, just a bunch of little different images going on there. But with this one, we're now gonna talk about um, roses, okay? That's what they call them. But really, they just look like a bunch of little leaves um, so they could look like, you know, you could have two, two leaves like this. Okay, those actually have their own name when they just have two. Um, it's like a propeller, right? Or they could have just two leaves going this way. That's still a prepare, propeller if these are not there, right? That's still a propeller. Um, and those I think I actually have next, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, those are called lemniscat, lemniscate, lem lemniscat, I can't say it. But these are the ones that are like um, uh, propellers. Okay. Roses will have um, three or four petals. So it might have four petals. It might be rotated where the petals are like this. I'm trying here to draw. I can't draw, but you get it. It might be rotated a little bit. It could only have three petals. It could have one like this, or it could be rotated where the center one is in the middle, or maybe the center one is at the bottom, right? Um, but they could have three petals. They could have five petals. They could have six petals. They can have as many petals as the graph has. And it all has to do with what number is being multiplied by your theta, okay? So that number that's being multiplied by theta inside the trig function is going to tell you how many petals you have, okay? Now, if that number inside is odd, then that's exactly the number of petals that you're going to have. But if that number inside is even, then you're gonna have twice that many petals, okay? So for instance, this one has a two on the inside, okay? What that means is it's an even number two. So I'm going to have two times two, which is four petals in this problem. If it were a three, I would have just three petals. If it were four, I would have eight petals. If it were a five, I would have five petals. If it were a six, I would have 12 petals. If it were a seven, I would have seven petals. You get the pattern, right? Odd number, it's the exact same number of petals. Even numbers, it's going to be twice the amount of petal, petals, okay? And that's just a good check, okay? So that after you've got it all graphed out, you make sure that your graph has the correct number of petals, okay? Now for the symmetries, let's go ahead and go through all of those. So for the X axes, Let's do that one. We have three cosine of two times negative theta, which is three cosine of negative two theta. And according to our even odd powers, that's the same as cosine of two theta. Now this does match. So I will have symmetry with respect to the X axis. Well, that's nice because it cuts down my um, my interval from zero to pi, right? So I only have to worry about what's going on in quadrant one and quadrant two, zero to pi. Now, let's keep going and let's test for the y-axis. So then I get three times cosine of two pi minus two theta. And so then if I use my different rules, I get cosine of two pi cosine of two theta plus sine of two pi and sine of theta. 
Now here, sine of two pi is um, zero. Cosine of two pi is one. So this will become r equal to three times one cosine of two theta, which is the same as three cosine of two theta. And that is the exact same as the original. So it will have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So we only had to go from zero to pi because of the x-axis. And it, of that interval, I am gonna actually be symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So I don't need to have both halves because whatever's on this half is gonna mirror over the y-axis. So now I'm down to the interval of zero to pi over two, okay? But it does still want me to check for all the symmetries. So I am gonna check for the last one. And just because you have these two symmetries does not mean that it will have symmetry with respect to the last one, okay? It just does not mean that. So we're gonna check. Sometimes it will have also with the origin and sometimes it won't. So let's go see. Four, we're gonna do R equals three cosine of two times theta plus pi. So I get three cosine of two theta plus two pi. And then if I use my sum angles, I have cosine of two theta, cosine of two pi minus cosine or no, I'm sorry, sine of two theta, sine of two pi. Now the sine of two pi is zero, so this is all gone. Cosine of two pi is one, so I end up with three times cosine of two theta, which is equivalent to the original, so I will have symmetry with respect to the origin as well. Now, all that means is that whatever's in this first quadrant, because I'm down to zero to pi over two, it's going to look the same over there, okay? So not only will this side look the same as that, and that side will look the same as this. Let me go over. Whatever's in this interval will look exactly mirror over the y-axis because of symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Whatever's in now in this quadrant is going to be symmetric with respect to the x-axis. So it'll be a mirror here. And coincidentally, that image will be a mirror of the image that was in the first quadrant. And also whatever's in this uh, quadrant will have to mirror over the y-axis and whatever's there should mirror over the x-axis. So it's basically gonna look like this or like this. Okay, this one of these two pictures because these two pictures are the ones that are gonna have all of that symmetry, okay? I won't know which one it is until I actually go and graph it, okay? So um, let's do the table. Again, we know how to do that in the calculator. I'm just gonna pretend I already did it in the calculator. And so then I get three and zero. I get, I'm gonna do 1.5 because it's visually better for me to see. Zero and pi over four, negative 1.5 and pi over three, and then negative three and pi over two. And so again, I'm gonna outline these guys so that they stand out to me. Okay, now let's see. We have three and zero, which is here. We have 1.5 and pi over six. We have zero and pi over four, which is the pole. Then we have negative 1.5 and pi over three out. So that means all the way over here. I do have to go counterclockwise because this is a positive angle. And then negative three and pi over two counterclockwise, which is down here. So it looks like 
this. Kind of like a C, right? It looks kind of like a C. So now I've got to take this and do all of my symmetry. So this piece has to reflect over the Y axis, which means it's going to look the same over here. And this piece has to reflect over the X axis. So that means it's going to look like this here. Now this piece has to do the same thing. It has to reflect over the X axis and it has to reflect over the Y axis. So, or I said that backwards, over the Y axis and over the X axis. So we're gonna flip this and then we're gonna take it and we're gonna flip it up this way too. Okay, now, what I have drawn now also has to flip over the X axis and the Y axis. So these guys already flip over themselves, they're good. This one needs to flip over this way and this one needs to flip over this way. And then now you'll notice that what's in here looks kind of like a V shape and it's mirror over down here. Similarly over here, this V shape is mirror over over here. Okay, so it has all of the symmetry that it's supposed to have. And now I know what it looks like, right? It, it kind of like looks like a petal cross, right? Um, but now I know which one it is. It's not the one that looks like an X. It's the one that looked like a T or a cross, okay? Okay, now the last one, which has to do with that propeller, okay? So it's not the same as the petal problem, okay? And how do I know that it's not the same? Because this one has R squared, okay? And not only does it have R squared, but it'll also have a squared number there, okay? And of course that number cannot equal zero because if it's zero, then you basically just have R equals zero, okay? Which is the pole, so, or the origin. So that's not what we have here. And let's go ahead and test for our symmetry and then we'll go through all of the motions there. So R squared equals nine cosine of two times negative theta, which is the same as cosine of negative two theta, which for cosine is the same as cosine of positive two theta. So it does have symmetry with respect to the X axis. Now, if I check for the Y axis, so it's two times pi minus theta. I get two pi minus two theta. And then the law, or not the law, the difference formula. So the sine of two pi is just zero. So I end up with nine times um, one times cosine of two theta, which is just nine cosine of two theta. And then finally, so I do have symmetry because that is equivalent to the original. And then if I do the origin, This is theta plus pi. So two theta plus two pi. I have cosine two theta, cosine two pi minus sine two theta, sine of two pi. Again, two pi makes all of that zero. We already know that cosine of two pi is one. So we end up with nine cosine of two theta, which is equivalent to the original. So we do have symmetry with respect to the origin, okay? Now, I wouldn't have gone just from zero 
to pi over four. Um, I know it has to do with the symmetry, but honestly, I would have gone all the way down to pi over two. Um, and so I am going to actually add the other two values here, pi over three and pi over two. I don't know what their justification was. It is true that you only need those, but I there's nothing in any of the lesson that has explained why you would only need zero to pi over four versus the other problem that had the exact same symmetry when we used zero to pi over two, right? So it just doesn't make any sense to me. I know they know what it's gonna look like already and that's why they just got zero to pi over four. But for us, we're just gonna work it all out, okay? So if I plug in, and I don't even know why they're not doing the whole graph. Oh, this is what they're doing. R squared equals nine cosine of two theta. So they're plugging in the theta into this first, and then they're going to take the square root of R to get this. And then I'm going to add another column for the point form. So this one's just like really halfway done. I don't like that they're trying to shortcut it, okay? So when I do um, nine cosine of two times zero, which is zero, I get nine. When I take the square root of nine, I get three. So the point here will be three, zero. When, oh, when you take the square root, what do you get? You get plus or minus, don't you? And maybe that's why they're doing only one point. So I'm gonna say plus or minus three which means I really have two points. I have three zero and negative three zero. We'll see how that is going to affect everything. Now, when I do nine cosine of two times, nine cosine of two times pi over six, I get nine halves. When I take the square root of that, I get two point, I'm just gonna say 2.1. So plus or minus 2.1 and pi over six. When I go in there and I do pi over four, I get zero, square root of zero is zero. So it's just 1.0 and pi over four. And then when I do pi over three, I get negative nine halves. That's why they did it. And when you try to take the square root of a negative nine halves, it's imaginary. You can't draw imaginaries. So there's no point here, okay? And when I do the same thing again with one pi over two, I get negative nine. So this is why they only went to pi over four, but it'd be nice if they explained why, right? And it says, why are these the only points we need to check? Well, now we know, right? because these two are gonna end up with imaginaries, which means we're not gonna get any points. But I personally would have done it to know that. I wouldn't have been able to look at it and just know that, okay? So definitely do that. We already know that if you have symmetry with respect to this one, you use zero to pi. When you have symmetry with respect to this one, you use zero or negative pi over two to pi over two. If you have both of them, you just need zero to pi over two. and then. Coincidentally, because of the trig functions, this one seems to be coinciding with these. But if not, this one is just zero to pi over two on its own, even if those two didn't happen, okay? So let's go ahead and graph what we've got here and then use our symmetry. So we've got three and zero, which is here. And then we've got negative three and zero, which is there. We have 2.1 and pi over six, which is here, and negative 2.1 and pi over six, which means it would be right here. And then we have zero and pi over four. Zero and pi over four means it's the pole. So we're gonna go this way. And then for the negatives, we're gonna go this way, okay? Now, 
We do have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. So I do have to flip these over the x-axis. So it's going to go um, in this direction. And then it, I do have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So I would make sure that this image was mirrored over here and vice versa. And then I do have symmetry with respect to the origin. So I would make sure that this point um, was over here, this point, actually that's it. And this point is over here and it is. So it has all of the symmetry that it needs, okay? Um, if you wanna do the symmetry with respect to the origin, you can then again, flip this little pedal propeller part over the x-axis and then flip that over the y-axis, but it basically just rotates on itself. And so it's the same image. And you flip this one over and then flip it over the y-axis, it's this side. So it is already got, it does already have all of the symmetry in there. And it is a propeller because of the R squared. Um, but that is the end of this section. I thought it was going to take me two full hours, but it only took me an hour and 22 minutes, which is not bad. It's just like seven minutes over a regular hour and 15 minute class. So with that, hopefully you are able to do your homework problems. Um, and that would be it for this week. Next week, we'll start getting into vectors.